Um, hey guys, good morning. Um, I want to apologize. I would have had this out to you a little bit earlier today, um, but I've actually decided to re-record my original video. Um, it was originally 50 minutes long, and if I'm being honest with you guys, it just wasn't really that good for the amount of time that you would have had to watch it. Um, so instead, I'm going to do things a little bit differently. I'm going to break up um, this week's lesson into two different parts. So we're going to start here in the week of 427. Um, as you guys can see, there's a few uh, files or links in here. Let me go over what each of those are. So this first one here, Hamilton Jefferson and the First National Bank, this is the reading that you guys will have to complete. Okay, It's only a few pages long. Um, you really don't have to look at these two paragraphs down here because we are going to do something further with primary sources and we're going to do that together in this video. So you're going to read here. So I'll kind of provide you guys some background on Hamilton Jefferson and the creation of the first national bank of the U.S. From there, um, let's head back to Schoology. And you guys will see two assignment links. The first is a document analysis Google Doc, and the second is a discussion board post. So you guys will be looking at um, some primary documents in this packet here. So this is that other link right in there, that PDF. You guys will be looking at some primary documents or some um, different visuals that help explain the the debate that Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton got into over the creation of the first national bank, um, specifically when it comes to its usefulness, whether or not it is necessary for the country, and largely whether or not the constitutional gives Congress the power to create an institution as large as a national bank. So that's what we will be exploring together in these uh, in this document packet. So that's kind of the largest change that I'm making to this video is that originally um, I kind of walked you guys through the slides that I took from the reading, but again, it was an incredibly long video. Um, this content, this reading is not too challenging. So I don't really think you guys need that extra assistance. If you do, feel free to log on to um, the virtual office hours that we'll have tomorrow morning and I will happily walk you through those. Okay, um, so at this point, if you guys are watching the video, go ahead and pause it, maybe pull up this reading, spend, you know, 20 minutes or so reading through this document before coming back to this video so that we can work through the documents together. Yep, all right. So, um, I will just kind of run through this quickly. Um, so hopefully you guys have done your reading now. If not, again, pause, go to the reading, and then come back. We'll review it quickly together before going into the documents. So Hamilton's idea of a national bank was largely based on the Bank of England that existed in the mid-1700s. He thought it was very successful. Um, he paid England actually a great compliment by wanting to replicate their financial system in the United States. Um, so of course, the National Bank of England could print money to lend to borrowers. They did have, you know, some level of gold and silver backing in the bank, but again, it was never as much as they lent out. They tried to keep it to um, a three to one ratio, essentially. So, obviously, if you guys are, you know, familiar with Oh, I guess I could present this, sorry. If you guys are familiar with the musical Hamilton, you know that you know no two men embodied these huge political divisions more than Jefferson and Hamilton at the time. Hamilton was in favor of a strong central government led by an educated elite of upper class, whereas Jefferson distrusted a strong central government. And so as a result, he wanted strong state and local governments. Uh, Hamilton believed that commerce and industry were the keys to a strong society, whereas Jefferson favored a nation of farmer citizens. He heavily uh, favored an agrarian society. Um, so again, we kind of talked about this, how Hamilton used the Bank of England um, for inspiration for the U.S. system. 
He wanted the bank to create a uniform currency to circulate throughout the country. Um, it would also serve as a place for the national government to deposit its money. So after taxes have been collected, that's where that uh, those funds would be held and also borrow money. Um, for example, in the cases of war, if they had to quickly fund military action, that money could be borrowed from the National Bank. Jefferson opposed Hamilton's plan, obviously. Um, he thought that states should charter banks that could issue money, so it would be handled on a state-by-state -state basis. Jefferson also strongly believed that the Constitution did not give uh, Congress the power to establish a bank. And Hamilton and Jefferson continue to debate this issue for many years to come and ultimately becomes a very important political issue in 1791. We're going to skip this. I kind of talked about this earlier. Um, so again, this was the Bank of England system. So it was partially backed with gold. So there was usually $1,000 worth of gold in the bank, which would generate about $3,000 worth of loans. Again, last week we talked about the risk that is associated with that. Um, the Bank of England really did try to stay close to this ratio um, because like we talked about that risk that if you know these, these borrowers want to, um, I'm sorry, if these lenders want to cash back in their funds for, for the gold, if everyone decides to do that one time, then the bank collapses. It's not able to support that system. Um, we're going to skip this because we will actually look at this in one of our uh, documents. So finally, in December of 1790, Hamilton submitted a report to Congress making the case. Um, he proposed a bank of the U.S. with a $10 million capital, which at the time that was five times more than all of the other banks combined. So those smaller banks that were operating. It would also give the National Bank the ability to issue paper money. It would be based in Philadelphia and it would be chartered for 20 years. Um, the federal government would have a minority stake in the bank. So uh, the federal government would be minority shareholders, um, but its board of directors would be private individuals, thus ensuring a mix of both public oversight and private enterprise. So a little bit of background on the constitutionality. Um, both Jefferson and Hamilton's arguments were based on the preamble, the elastic clause, and the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. One second. All right. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So... Hamilton argued that the elastic clause grants Congress the right to make laws that are both necessary and proper to carry out other powers given to Congress. Um, so, for example, you know, a place for the government to deposit their funds. Um, it would make the process of collecting taxes easier. Hamilton deemed this as both necessary and proper to the country. So as a result, he says, yes, Congress absolutely does have the constitutional power to create this national bank under the elastic clause. Um, so again, Jefferson said no. He did not think that Congress had the right to create such a large institution like a national bank because the 10th Amendment states that any power that is not specifically granted to the uh, to the national government or specifically denied to the states were given to the states or the people. So that is why he thought that the institution of a bank automatically just defaults to the states to be handled on a state by state basis because that power is not explicitly given to the national government and it's not explicitly denied to the state government. Um, whereas Hamilton also used the preamble to argue that a national bank would promote the general welfare. It would be for the betterment of the country. It would help to establish a more perfect union. Okay, so again, as we get into these primary documents, we're going to look a little bit deeper into um, how these two argued their specific cases. So ultimately, um, in 1791, the bank became publicly available and 
uh, share prices skyrocketed, which almost seemed to confirm its value. Um, however, like we talked about earlier, it had to be renewed every 20 years. So it expired in 1811, and the Senate rejected a bid to renew it. However, President, President Madison heavily felt these consequences during the War of 1812, when there was no central bank to fund the military effort. So as a result of this bank lapsing, um, the U.S. was really hurting during the War of 1812. And so as a result, Madison endorses renewal in 1816. So the charter of this second bank of the United States also expired. Um, it expired under President Andrew Jackson, and it is Jackson that lets it lapse once again. Um, ironically, it's Jackson's acting secretary of state, James Alexander Hamilton, who opposed the very bank that his father had created. Um, and this time there would be no quick renewal. So we talked about how the first bank lapses in 1811, but it's once again renewed in 1816 once Madison has endorsed it. But this time it doesn't happen so quick. Um, Congress allowed certain nationally chartered banks during the Civil War, like we discussed last week, but the modern Federal Reserve System did not come into existence until 1914, so a considerable amount of time later. Um, so getting into a little bit of what we talked about last week, the fall of the Second National Bank allowed state chartered banks to flourish. Um, so this period between 1837 and 1863 is typically known as the free banking or the wildcat era. Uh, we talked about some of the issues associated with these smaller banks. Um, typically, there were scams associated with them. Um, a lot of banks defaulted because they didn't have the proper gold and silver backing to accommodate all the people that were trying to bank with them. Um, and again, there's many different currencies. So it was not a uniform system, and that caused a lot of different issues um, in the early stages of the country. So we're going to move on to our primary source analysis now. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, I think I talked about that a little bit longer than I wanted to, but that is okay. So now what I'm going to have you guys do is head to so this packet here, Hamilton's Bank Student Handout. You guys will open it. You'll see this page. Go ahead and scroll down to visual two for me. Visual one is just some reference vocab. Visual two is the first excerpt that we will be looking at, which is excerpt from the report of the Secretary of the Treasury on the subject of a national bank. This was read to the House of Representatives on December 13th, 1790. And in this excerpt, Hamilton is explaining the merits of a national bank, so how it's going to benefit the country. <coughs> All right, um, so I'm going to read through this. If you would rather uh, read this independently, feel free to pause me, fast forward to when we actually get to the document analysis. So, the following are among the principal advantages of a bank. First, the augmentation of the active or productive capital of a country. Gold and silver, where they are employed merely as the instruments of exchange and alienation, have been, not improperly, denominated dead stock. But, when deposited in banks to become the basis of a paper circulation, which takes their character and place as the signs or representatives of value, they then acquire life, or in other words, an active and productive quality. So this is particularly important for us. We're gonna get back in a little bit and discuss what um, this specific line means. Um, Hamilton, you know, has, has a way with words. He loves to, uh, he loves to go toward that flowery, flowery language, which is not so easy for us to decode nowadays. Um, but again, that's kind of why I'm walking you guys through this video. We will do this together. So if you don't understand what he means quite yet, it is okay. We will talk about it. We will discuss it. So you guys will be good to go on your document analysis. This idea, which appears rather subtle and abstract in a general form, may be made obvious and palpable by entering into a few particulars. 
It is evident, for instance, that the money which a merchant keeps in his chest, waiting for a favorable opportunity to employ it, produces nothing till that opportunity arrives. So again, he's saying if you are keeping some money locked away, that you're not really gaining anything until, of course, you use that money to, you know, purchase something new for your store. You're purchasing a new good or a service. So what he's getting at here, what he's just starting to hint at, is one of the one of the uh, pros of the creation of a national bank is that money can be collecting interest. So you can actually be earning a profit on your funds that would otherwise just be sitting there, not collecting money. So, but if, instead of looking up in this manner, he either deposits it in a bank or invests it in the stock of a bank, it yields a profit during the interval. So again, that idea of interest, you're profiting by keeping your money in a bank, in which he partakes or not according to the choice he may have made of being a depositor or a proprietor. And when, he, and when any advantageous speculation offers, in order to be able to embrace it, he has only to withdraw his money. If a depositor or if a proprietor to obtain a loan from the bank or to dispose of his stock, an alternative seldom or never attended with difficulty when the affairs of the institution are in a prosperous train. His money thus deposited or invested is a fund upon which himself and others can borrow to a much larger amount. It is a well-established fact that banks in good credit can circulate a far greater sum than the actual quantum of their capital in gold and silver. The extent of the possible excess seems indeterminate, though it has been conjecturally stated at the proportions of two and three to one. Okay, so it's down here that he's starting to talk about the amount of gold that is going to be kept in the reserves versus the amount of paper currency that is going to be out there circulating. So let's go to your Google Doc here. So for Visual 2, you guys have two questions to answer. The first, what does Hamilton mean by asserting that gold and silver employed merely as instruments of exchange were dead stock that could acquire life when deposited in banks to become the basis of paper circulation. So again, it's a little bit wordy. Um, however, this is kind of what we started to talk about a little bit earlier. Um, that essentially what Hamilton is asserting here is that simply money kept in banks can be loaned and they can earn interest. He says that greatly contributes to the merit of a national bank, that those are advantageous for um, large groups of people, that it's gonna be good for the public welfare. If there's money in the bank which can be loaned out or you can be earning interest on. So the second question here says, what proportion of paper money in circulation does Hamilton suggest? So that comes in the second paragraph. So down here, um, where I pointed this out earlier, when he's talking about um, the ratio of gold and silver kept in reserves to the paper currency that is out circulating. So the extent of the possible excess seems indeterminate, though it has been conjecturally stated at the proportions of two and three to one. So essentially he is saying two to three times the amount of gold and silver deposits, that is the amount of paper money that will be out circulating. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's head down to visual three. Summary of the law creating the first bank of the United States. So in this visual, it's just gonna hit um, the key points of Hamilton's bank. So this appeared in February of 1791. Number one, bank stock will be worth $10 million. Number two, 25,000 shares will be sold for $400 each. Number three, subscriptions to buy those shares will sell at $25 each, and full payment for a share will be due within two years. 
Number four, stockholders are required to pay for each share with $100 in gold or silver coin and $300 in U.S. government bonds. Number five, the government will buy 5,000 shares or $2 million of the bank stock. Six, subscribers of this bank will be paid 6% interest per year. Number seven, the bank will be run by a 25-man board of directors with not more than three quarters of them eligible for re-election the next year. 20 will be selected by shareholders and five by the government. Eight, only stockholders who are U.S. citizens will be eligible to serve as a director. Nine, Congress must approve loans to any state or foreigner. Ten, the bank will be located in Philadelphia with branches, uh, sorry, with branch offices in cities across the country. And 11, the bank charter will run for 20 years subject to renewal by Congress. Okay, so let's take a look at the questions you guys have for visual three. The first is asking, what is usury? So we're going to head up here to your glossary of terms, this last one here. Usury is lending money at exorbitant interest rates higher than permitted by law and considered unfair. So essentially, all usury is is when banks ha uh, when banks are charging an obscenely high interest rate that isn't comparable uh, to that which other banks might be um, might be lending at. So you guys can simply put that definition in there. We're going to look at number two now. What safeguard did Hamilton put in place? against usury. So we'll head back down to our document here. So maybe take a look. Think about which one of these terms might avoid an unfair interest rate, a higher than market interest rate. Okay, well, hopefully you are thinking number six. Subscribers of this bank will be paid 6% interest per year. Um, so again, borrowers could now avoid usury because they would have the option to borrow from the national bank at a set interest rate. That was written in stone. It was set in stone. It could not be altered. And then your last question here says, were there any other safeguards? So what other you know, what other protections did Hamilton write into this proposal? So, for example, um, directors had to rotate off the bank's board and they could not serve for life. So it's talking about re-election. Again, you may not serve for life. Congress had to approve loans to states and foreigners. Um, the bank's charter was for 20 years. Ultimately, we know what ends up happening there. Um, so it is lapsed in 1811. It is re-signed in 1816. And then the second charter of the bank lapses again under President Andrew Jackson. Um, and only stockholders who were U.S. citizens were eligible to serve as directors. So point number eight right here. All of those are some additional safeguards that were written into the proposal. Visual four, Hamilton's list of national bank advantages. So again, he is really trying to sell this to Congress, how this is going to be a beneficial system for the country as a whole. So in this report, Hamilton made a case for how banks should work and dispelled rumors about banking in this report sent to Congress. So he says, it is a fact well understood that public banks have found admission and patronage among the principal and most enlightened commercial nations. So he's referencing other banks, other nations that have banks that have been successful and successful for a long period of time. So he says they have successfully obtained in Italy, Germany, Holland, England, and France, as well as in the United States. And it is a circumstance which cannot but have considerable weight 
in a candid estimate of their tendency that after an experience of centuries, there exists not a question about their utilities in the countries in which they have been so long established. So he's saying, you know, these, these countries have had these systems long in place, and there's not currently an ongoing debate about whether or not they are useful or necessary. Hamilton is simply stating that they are, and they have time on their side to prove that. So a summary of the report, a national bank would provide the following. Number one, branch banks in every major city throughout the United States. Two, common currency equally acceptable throughout the land. Three, new money created through borrowing, which would expand the money supply. Four, emergency loans to the government. Five, a place to pay taxes and deposit government money. Six, a banking alternative for borrowing that would prevent usury. Seven, capital for economic growth and prosperity of the nation. Increased production of U.S. made products leading to increased trade and, in and creating an incentive for emigration, which would help the nation to grow. Actually, I think we have some more. Okay, yep. Um, so Hamilton offered this opinion in rebuttal to the concerns of Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson and Attorney General Edmund Randolph regarding the formation of a national bank. So again, these are the points that Hamilton offered um, in order to hopefully disprove the points that Thomas Jefferson and other uh, opponents were bringing up. So number one, he says the U.S. government has sovereign power and the Constitution is the law of the land. Two, implied powers are to be considered as delegated equally with express powers. Number three, a national bank relates to the collection of taxes in two ways, collecting taxes and paying bills, paying national bills. Four, a national bank allows the government to borrow money in emergencies, such as a time of war. Five, coining money is an expressed power and banks facilitate circulation of money. Six, public debt is needed to pay for the common defense. And lastly, seven, a common currency is not only convenient for the treasury, but more efficient than using 13 different currencies that would have existed with uh, state level banks, state chartered banks. So your first question here for visual four, what other nations had public banks? So he listed several examples, um, Italy, Germany, Holland, England, and France were all specifically cited by Hamilton. Which reasons for a national bank would assist the government in conducting its business? So take a few minutes, go through this list, Which of these would promote commerce? Which of these would promote trade and the country's economy on a large scale basis? So for example, um, branches in every major city, common currency equally accepted throughout the land, new money created through borrowing, which would expand the money supply, um, an increased production of U.S. made products leading to increased trade and creating an incentive for emigration, which would help the nation grow. So again, Hamilton is laying out a lot of pros here about how this is going to positively affect the country's economy, how it's going to, again, getting back to that idea of promoting the general welfare. In his mind, he's creating a more perfect union here. He's creating a system that's going to benefit everyone on a larger scale. All right, so with visuals five and six, we are looking at um, Jefferson's opposition to a national bank. So we're going to be looking at the reasons why he happened to oppose it, um, both constitutionally and otherwise.
All right, so this first excerpt that we're looking at actually comes from um, the biography of Alexander Hamilton that was used as the inspiration for Lin-Manuel Miranda's uh, musical. So not quite a primary source. However, it is, uh, you know, very credible. It's a good resource for us to look at. So like many Virginia plantation owners, Jefferson was land rich and cash poor and chronically indebted to British creditors. By the late 1780s, as tobacco prices plummeted, Virginia planters struggled to repay old debts to London creditors and demanded the return of slaves carried off by British troops. The steep payments he owed British bankers forced Jefferson to retain his enormous workforce of slaves, despite his professional hatred for the institution. The torment of mind I endure till the moment shall arrive when I shall owe not a shilling on earth is such really as to render life of little value, he told his American manager in 1787. But he would not sell land to pay his debts, nor would I willingly sell the slaves as long as there remains any prospect of paying my debts with their labor. The weight of that debt created by his own extravagance perhaps prevented Thomas Jefferson from being the person he would ideally like to have been. Even while Secretary of State, he remained in hock to British creditors for an exorbitant 7,000 pounds. He carried these large debts until his death in 1826, necessitating the sale of 130 of his slaves at Monticello six months later. It was not the image that the philosopher of the common man would have preferred to leave to posterity. All right, so I just did a quick converter online. Um, 7,000 pounds in 1787 is a little over $1 million today. Um, so Jefferson was in a considerable amount of debt. He owed a great deal of money to these English creditors. As members of the Virginia plantation world, both Jefferson and Madison had a nearly visceral contempt for market values and then, uh, intended to denigrate commerce as grubby, parasitic, and degrading. Like landed aristocrats throughout history, they betrayed a snobbish disdain for commerce and financial speculation. Jefferson perpetuated a fantasy of America as an agrarian paradise with limited household manufacturing. He favored the placid, unchanging rhythms of rural life, not the unruly urban dynamic articulated by Hamilton. For Jefferson, banks were devices to fleece the poor, oppress farmers, and induce a taste for luxury that would subvert Republican simplicity. Strangely enough for a large slaveholder, he thought agriculture was egalitarian, while manufacturing would produce a class-conscious society. So for this one here, you guys are simply answering, what were some of the reasons why Jefferson and other plantation owners disliked banks? So if you have to, go ahead, read back through, you can pause the video. Um, but ultimately, they they were short on cash and frequently had to borrow. And they considered commerce to be, what does he say, grubby, grubby, parasitic, and degrading. Um, Jefferson thought that agrarian life was superior and that manufacturing should be limited to households and viewed banks as what does he say? Devices to fleece the poor, oppress farmers, and induce a taste for luxury that would subvert Republican simplicity. All right, and our last visual here is an excerpt from Thomas Jefferson's letter to President George Washington on February 15th of 1791. Um, so at this point, Congress had already passed the bill, 
And this was Jefferson's attempt as Secretary of State as kind of a last minute, um, you know, Hail Mary, because Jefferson, I'm sorry, Washington at the time hadn't yet signed the bill into law. So Jefferson was hoping that he could convince him otherwise. And again, this letter um, largely lays out the constitutional arguments that Jefferson holds against the creation of a national bank. He says, I consider the foundation of the Constitution as laid on this ground that all powers not delegated to the U.S. by the Constitution, not prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states or to the people. So again, that's the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. <laughs> Don't want to set up. Um, to take a single step beyond the boundaries, thus specifically drawn around the powers of Congress, is to take possession of a boundless field of power, no longer susceptible of any definition. The incorporation of a bank and other powers assumed by this bill have not, in my opinion, been delegated to the U.S. by the Constitution. It has been much urged that a bank will give great facility or convenience in the collection of taxes. Suppose this were true. Yet the Constitution allows only the means which are necessary, not those which are merely convenient for affecting the enumerated powers. If such a latitude of construction be allowed to this phrase as to give any non-enumerated power, it will go to everyone, for there is not one which ingenuity may not torture into convenience in some way or other to someone of so long a list of enumerated powers. It would swallow up all the delegated powers and reduce the whole to one phase as before observed. Therefore, it was that the Constitution restrained them to be necessary means, that is to say, to those means without which the grant of the power would be nugatory. So he's saying here that just because the bank is going to be convenient doesn't mean it's necessary. And he's using the argument that if we allow this to go through, it just becomes a slippery slope of what Congress will find a way to get through, even if it is not expressly laid out in the Constitution. Besides, the existing banks will without a doubt enter into agreements for, their len for lending their agency, and the more favorable, as there will be a competition among them for it. Whereas the bill delivers us up bound to the National Bank, who are free to refru refuse all arrangements, but on their own terms, and the public not free on such refusal to employ any other bank. That of Philadelphia, I believe, now does this business by their post notes, which by an arrangement with the Treasury are paid by any state collector to whom they are presented. This expedient alone suffices to prevent the existence of that necessity, which may justify the assumption of a non-enumerated power as a means for carrying into effect an enumerated one. The thing may be done, and has been done, and well done without this assumption. Therefore, it does not stand on that degree of necessity, which can honestly justify it. It may be said that a bank whose bills would have a currency all over the states would be more convenient than one whose currency is limited to a single state. So it would be still more convenient that there should be a bank whose bills should have a currency all over the world. But it does not follow from the superior conveniency that there exists anywhere a power to establish such a bank, or that the world may not go on very well without it. So his last line here, he's essentially making the point that it would be far more convenient if the whole world operated on a central bank, a central currency. But he's saying that that power doesn't exist. To establish such a bank cannot be done. There is not a power that exists that could make that work. So he's using that argument um, to argue against it, specifically looking at the United States as well. So a summary of his letter, number one, First and foremost, the government does not have the constitutional power to establish a bank. Two, 
a national bank would have unfair advantage over state banks and hinder them. So that's what he's specifically talking about in his second uh, paragraph here, where he's talking about those existing banks. He's referring to those state banks and how it would negatively affect them. So your last question, what were Jefferson's legal arguments against a national bank? Um, he does lay out quite a few, but ultimately what he gets back to um, is that uh, the elastic clause. He's saying that, yes, while very convenient, a bank is not necessary. It is not a necessity. Therefore, Congress is not granted that power. Um, he believes the right to create a national bank was not explicitly written in the Constitution and so would be unconstitutional and harmful to state banks, which again, he believes that the power falls to the states to create a bank because in the Constitution, it is not explicitly given to the national government and it is not explicitly denied to the states, meaning that it is left up to the states and the people to decide. So that is all we have for our document analysis. So once you have uh, finished up these questions, go ahead back into Schoology, submit that document, and then head to the discussion board where you guys have just one question. That's not numbered super well, um, but it is opinion-based. So were Hamilton's arguments for the bank better than Jefferson's arguments against it? Your answer should be based on number one, the need for the bank. So was it necessary under the elastic clause definition or is it simply convenient? And then number two, the issue of constitutionality according to Hamilton versus Jefferson. Who do you think um, wins that argument there? So um, after you guys have submitted that, you are all set for the week. Make sure you have your assignments in by Friday at 11.59 p.m., please. And tomorrow at 11, we have our virtual office hours. So if there's anything that you guys need help with, feel free to pop on tomorrow morning, and I will do my best to walk you through that. All right, guys, have a great week. Take some time for yourself, and look at that. I'm, I'm eight minutes quicker than I was last time. <laughs> Bye, guys.